Hey, Care Partners, Teresa Youngstrom. I hope you're having a great day. I wanted to just share some more ideas with you today about dementia and memory loss and all the different aspects of it. You know, if you've met one person with dementia, well, you've met one person because they're all different. We get it at different ages. There's 120 different diagnoses that can give us symptoms. And you know, it's ever changing. Um, I know with my mom, when I would come in, you kind of would have to assess where is she right now? She could be back 25 years in time, or she could be tracking with me. You never knew. But we certainly had to learn to join her on the journey. And the longer that I'm in this business, you know, I'm an old nurse and have lots of experience caring for people um, over the years, almost 40 years being a nurse. It's just incredible. And one thing I had a lot of experience going into people's homes is um, hoarding and hiding things. So I thought, you know what, this would be a good thing to talk to you about. Some of you have experienced it. And um, why do they do that? So let's bring up my PowerPoint and let's talk a little bit about why they hoard things. Why do they hide things? There we go. Um, and I learned that sometimes, sometimes this can be an early symptom um, of dementia when things are just starting to... Um, where they're because you really folks that have brain failure, they frequently have it for gosh, five, 10 years, maybe longer before we start to see the symptoms because now they're making mistakes that uh, they can't cover for any longer. And so, um, this may be something you might see. I know I knew a family who had counseled with me about their mom, and uh, it was around the Christmas season. Um, a friend had taken her to a dollar store. Everything is a dollar at this particular dollar store. And uh, she was, she was very, her heart was good. She wanted to send Christmas cards this year, holiday cards. And uh, she bought a hundred dollars worth of holiday cards. <laughs> and her daughter was stunned. And she called me and she said, we have a hundred dollars worth of holiday cards in my foyer in bags. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, let's talk. Let's get a meeting together. Let's get a consultation and talk about that. And maybe we need to have, you know, some better boundaries. Or maybe we need to have folks that are uh, more experienced taking her to stores and things like that. So anyway, let's let's talk a little bit about this. Why did they do it? I mean, there can be so many reasons why. Um, it can start with a fear thing. It can start with um, them forgetting where they're putting things, and so they put them in special places. You know, with my mom, she was wheelchair-bound. She didn't really have the advantage of um, putting things in a lot of different places, but early on, she put her teeth somewhere. Yeah, put her teeth. She'd had dentures, I guess, almost all my life that I can remember back and uh, she put her teeth somewhere. And do you know, we never found that upper plate. Um, and you can't usually just have one plate in there. I've seen people do it. Um, it's not great. Uh, but usually they'll wear the upper plate, not the bottom plate. And so we never did find, even after she passed and we cleaned things out, we never did find her teeth. It was kind of amazing. Um, and I also had a family whose um, dad put the hearing aids somewhere. You know, it's interesting that in, once we're well into the disorder, um, it's hard to teach them new things. And so if the short-term memory is damaged um, and you bring in new things, new pieces of equipment, new items, hearing aids, starting hearing aids late in the disease can be really tricky if, say, they don't have a lot of care and someone who's going to help them take them out, put them in, and put them in the safe places. Because they can frequently uh, say, I don't, I don't wear this thing, and they can throw it away. Or they can put it in a really safe place, wad it up in some tissues, and uh, it goes out with the trash. So it may be early on that they still have awareness and they're forgetting where they're putting things. And so they think... They plan where they're going to put it, but it's not where it goes. But they think, oh, I'm going to put this here on this shelf so I'll, I'll remember where it is. Well, we know how that goes. 
and it doesn't go that well. And so they don't remember where they put it. Um, they think they're securing things, but they're not. Um, paranoia can also cause us to start hoarding things or putting things in interesting places. Um, I knew a lady who had a trailer and uh, she became a client later on. And um, I think the neighbors noticed that she wasn't taking out the trash anymore. Um, that probably went on several years uh, before the time that I found her down in her house. And uh, we made better arrangements for her. But, you know, if you, you can even send uh, adult protective services out, um, which one of the neighbors had called. And as long as she can come out and say, everything's good, everything's fine. You know, they have a lot of worse cases um, with people who are struggling worse. And so they didn't, they didn't enter into her home or see how crazy things were. Um, but early on, um, early on, they just start stacking things and putting things in interesting places. And you might even see them if you take them out to lunch or something, the little sugar packets, the ketchup packets, things like that. They may want to keep all those things, salt and pepper packets, things like that. Start filling their pockets with those things. Uh, they're paranoid that they're not going to have enough. Um, they may be afraid that you're going to steal from them. And so again, they may start stocking up uh, or putting things in places where they really don't go, um, putting their purse in places it really doesn't go because they're so afraid someone's going to steal that from them. Um, yeah, keep in mind that the logic is probably gone out the window for these individuals. And if there's no logic, then you know, they're, they're not going to understand, A, why they shouldn't do that or why that would not be a good idea. So we're going to have to have some grace with these individuals whose brains are failing. We need to be able to uh, join them on the journey, not get, you know, tug them up to where we're thinking or chastise them or finger wag them down or remind, remind, yeah, you can't use that R word or the one that says, remember, I don't like those R words <laughs> because if they would, they could. All right. They would, they could. Keep in mind though, that the logic is not there. They're doing the best they can. I knew a woman who was in um, a nursing home and when I would visit her, um, her tray would come, it would be time for him to pick up the tray and she'd say, get all that stuff off the tray and put it in the drawer. And I thought, well, okay, I wasn't there in a capacity to train her or fix things. I was there just visiting. And uh, I did take those crackers and whatever else was left on her tray that wasn't, you know, milk or something that was going to just, um, be, you know, go bad on her. And I pulled the drawer out and it was like, oh, Oh my goodness gracious, you know, she had a full drawer of crackers and creamers and salts and peppers and um, graham crackers and all, all the different uh, items that will be on your tray. And so it was, it was definitely starting. And I think she was one of those that would be paranoid that she was going to run out of things. She had lived through hard times and uh, was afraid she was going to run out of food. So running out of food can be a problem. So the woman who quit taking out her trash, I am going to tell you that her place was a little worse than this. Um, everything was at least two feet deep um, when we finally did help her get onto a better place and needed to, to help out cleaning up a trailer. Um, it was pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. So I, you don't even want more details on that, but how bad it can be, but it can get really bad. You know, for some of you, you're just noticing that they're not taking the news, throwing newspapers away anymore and you've got a stack of newspapers. Or I had one lady who would get the menu at the nursing home and she couldn't throw away the menus because she needed to know what she had on that particular day. Now she would get a couple of months worth of menus stacked up on her bedside table. And, um, was there any logic there? No. Can you and I see any reason to hang on to menus from your tray at the nursing home? I would say no. In her mind, it made all kinds of sense. And uh, we'll talk nor we'll talk in a minute about some techniques on what to do there. Um, 
Yeah, so they may want to stock up on things. We kind of talked about that. But, you know, sometimes these folks were collectors anyway. And so maybe they collected things. Maybe there was an organized um, shelving of things in the beginning or earlier in their lives. They were collectors. And that once dementia set on set in, that's just become unorganized and worse. But she knew she was a collector. And so we're going to save things, buy things, save things. I knew one woman who she would even buy things and never take them out of the bag. And so the bag would get set down, set down with the items that she purchased that she thought she needed. And even this was back in the day, she paid with cash. And so um the, the change from her purchase was in the bottom of the bag. And so there were, I don't know, 50 bags in her living room that had items. They were still in the bag and, um, and there were coins still on the bottom. There was change in the bottom of the bag. So maybe it starts off that there's someone who saves things anyway. Um, so it can be an early symptom. Um, like I said, maybe their heart's in the right place. But, you know, they can't follow through. So they initiate things, but then they can't follow through. And this reminds me of the woman I told you about in the beginning who she wanted to do the holiday cards, but then she couldn't follow through. I remember in my situation with my mom helping her with holiday cards. And in the beginning, she could do them and I just did the address. But then later, she got to the point where all she could do was sign her name. And I did everything else. And then it got to the point where she couldn't do any of that as she lost dexterity and her ability to connect the dots between what she wanted to say and the, and being able to write with that pen. And so then I would just do them for her and we'd just talk about who we wanted to send them to. And then it finally got to the point where it was more agitating than pleasant for her. And we would do different things. Do you see how you go through transition and you meet them where they are. You meet them with their needs and what their activities are. And it's going to change. It's going to change. I wish I could tell you guys that, oh, they've got a cure, but we don't. So we just need to learn to come alongside and uh, serve them in where their needs are at the time. So where do you start? You know, if you're noticing hoarding, you're noticing they're saving everything. What do you do? Um, I like I, I start with what brings them danger. And so it's important to know that bringing in, you know, housekeepers and uh, completely cleaning out the place, I probably wouldn't start there because there's usually emotional um, attachment to those things, even though we can't see it. All right. Um, I will tell you that, you know, it's good to remove the dangerous things. So if, say, they've got um, papers piles of paper overflowing into where uh, vents are, heaters are, things like that, then that's something we need to start with. Um, there's any weapons in the house. Those are things that we should think about and, and plan for and, and get them in a safe place. Um, just anything that's going to bring fire hazard, chemicals under the sink um, that they may misuse. Um, remember, the vision has challenges too, along with you know, there are other senses, vision, hearing, sense of smell. So I had a woman who made a tall glass of miracle Grow, and that I'm just glad that someone was there and witnessed that um, because what if later she forgot that was miracle Grow and thought it was Kool-Aid or something, some type of a, a drink and would drink that. So we need to get the chemicals secured and whether that is moving them to a garage in a cabinet that has a lock on it, um, but this, I would say in the bathroom items, you know, sometimes I'll go into a home and they have the disinfectant wipes on the back of the commode and it's next to the baby wipes and, uh, or some type of personal care wipe that someone might use after they go to the bathroom. And I just want to let you know that, you know, the Lysol wipes don't go there. They really need to be in a cabinet secured somewhere else where we're not going to use those inappropriately. I do know that there was a time when someone used a disinfectant wipe on my mother and that was not a good deal. Okay. And she was red for several days and very unhappy camper, as you can imagine. So just open your eyes, look around and see what, what, what items shouldn't be here. Let's talk, you know, I mean, even scissors, scissors on a table, maybe steak knives, 
things like that. So what dangerous items are around that maybe they're collecting um, that we should secure? I guess I kind of slipped into um, home safety, but it's just how I'm wired. Um, but I would say let's let's kind of just reduce the clutter um, to start there. And because of the emotional attachment, you may need to A, start slow, but you also may need to do this um, when they're not home. So maybe someone takes dad out um, to, you know, whatever he's still able to do, play golf or go for a walk or just go to lunch. And someone comes in and just reduces the clutter. Maybe we just reduce the number of newspapers. Maybe we make the path a little wider where he needs to walk between the family room and the kitchen or his bedroom or the bathroom. Okay. If there's a wheelchair, widen it enough that the wheelchair can make it. Um, we've done all kinds of crazy adjustments to make this work, but you don't need to, um, remove everything at one time in front of them telling them it's for their own good. That's not going to go over very well. Okay. Um, they're doing the best they can with what they have left and they will remember how you make them feel. And although we're thinking safety, safety, you know, we still need to remember there's a person in there whose brain is not doing well that we love and we care for. And the goal is not to drive a wedge in the relationship with them. The goal is to come alongside, join them on the journey. And since our brains are still working, how can we provide safety for them? How can we reduce the number of newspapers? How can we, you know, maybe um, move a few things so that the the vents um, for the furnace can still get the cold air return and still still blow the warm air, things like that, okay? I don't want you to dive in too quickly. I'm not saying, you know, go get a dumpster and put it outside their house and clean out their house. You never heard me say that. Um, maybe you start with bins. Maybe you just um, want to join them to tell them you're um, having spring cleaning and these bins really worked out so well. And mom, I wanted to see if this would work for you and we could kind of, you know, collect things so you can always find what you need. And maybe you go about it and maybe you take her shopping to pick out the bins how would that be if she still has capacity? You know, mom, did you want these, these wicker bins or do you want these plastic ones? And I would give her an either or, let her choose. It makes her feel like she's still in control. And then we work on it, you know, in that capacity. And we start off slow. Maybe we just, you know, work on the foyer and get things kind of cleaned up in there. Or the, you know, the kitchen, the bedroom, whatever, whatever needs, needs work. But if, if it's not good, if she's going to get upset and she starts to get agitated, then that's when it'd be better if she wasn't there. But still, we don't do a tremendous amount of work and think that she's going to not be surprised. Okay, I know they have limited vision, you know, more like a scuba mask and the vision comes in, the peripheral vision gets heavily damaged but don't think they won't notice it, um, in their space, in their living space, okay? And actually, I had a woman um, completely redo her mother's bedroom once out of kindness, out of joy. She loved her mom. She thought it would be great to freshen up her bedroom. She moved the bed, put up a flat screen TV, got her new curtains. It was beautiful. Her mom was furious. Why would you think? Well. It didn't look like her bedroom, and she started saying she wanted to go home. And so when the daughter called me saying, I can't believe she's so angry, it's so bizarre, I said, well, tell me more. What's going on? What have you guys been doing? And she goes, oh, my gosh, I did a total remake of her bedroom. It's so beautiful. Turned the bed, got rid of that old tiny TV, and uh, put up a flat screen. I said, oh, dear. I said, you're going to have to put it all back, you know, and she was like, what? And I said, well, you it's like changing her, her living location. You know, they, it's not comfortable at all. It doesn't look familiar anymore. And so it can be very confusing and they may feel like they're not home anymore. And there's something about familiarity that brings some peace. You know, that easy chair that looks like it should have been replaced a couple years ago. Yeah. But you know what? That brings them, that's comfortable. That's their happy place. And that old remote to that old TV, I'm recommending you just leave it alone, along with that old coffee maker, as long as it's safe. 
because you start changing out these things and you feel like this is just you helping and using your own money to get them a new microwave. Well, if they can't use it, that's not really helping. Okay. Hear my heart on this. We want to be able to serve and join these people on the journey, but sometimes we complicate things because we didn't see through how this um, gesture of kindness could backfire. Okay. All right. So this bins idea that might help you. It may be a good time to make duplicates of the valuable jewelry, you know, to take the jewelry and explain you're going to get it cleaned. We take it to the jeweler and have maybe a cubic zirconia put in there and then give it back to her. It might be a really good idea. And then we put the good jewelry in a safe. I've seen so many people lose jewelry, wondering if it was taken, wondering if it, wondering if it was just thrown away. It's a heartbreak. It might have been a family gem or something, you know, and I know stuff is stuff, but still there's value and there's emotional value to these things. And uh, because things are going to get lost. So we might need a duplicate of glasses, keys, the remote. Oh, hearing aids. Wow. Especially if you, if there's no one there when they take these items out um, and, or if they didn't learn, learn the routine of using these things back when their memory was better. You see, they frequently can look back and remember things in the past, but it's the new stuff that they can't really remember. And so um, getting hearing aids, I told you before, late in the game can be a problem because they're more likely to lose them. So it might, if you can afford to have duplicates of these things, or maybe you get a new, new set of hearing aids, but you keep the old pair just because um, there may be a time when all of a sudden we can't find one of those. Okay. All right, we'll move the slide. Okay. All right. So hopefully this has been a great review um, about hoarding and about collecting things and why they do these things. Sometimes it's, I am afraid that, um, I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. I'm afraid I'm going to forget I know that I'm forgetful, and so I need to put it in a place where I can find it later. Of course, then my short term doesn't let me find it again. Um, there's some people that just start misplacing things, and they're putting the gym shoes in the refrigerator, you know, and, and things like that. Um, so there just might be things out of place. I know that for couples or um, people living together, sometimes if mom still is determined to unload that dishwasher, well, it might be okay to um, let her unload it, but, you know, just watch and then go back and fix it later. Please, please, please don't be correcting her as she's doing it. Okay. Mom, I told you, mom, I told you that's not great. So maybe just follow up. And if she's now putting, you know, all the glasses where the plates go, oh, well, or she's putting the clean plates in the refrigerator, oh, well, you know, and it's okay to just let some things go. Don't be hyper about it. Um, it's not going to be perfect. We got to be grace givers. We got to love them through this. They're doing the best they can, like I said, with what they have left. And I want you to be able to go with the flow, bring in help when it's needed or move them to the next um, living situation once it's time. Okay. Counsel about that. So we make really good choices. All right. I hope that's a good tip for you today. I'm Teresa Youngstrom, and I hope you can find more of my podcast um, at, you can find it at TeresaYoungstrom.com on my website. There's a tab for podcast. You can also find it on YouTube, Memory Care with Teresa Youngstrom. And, um, Please like, share, subscribe, and a big shout out to Griffo Productions for being such a great broadcaster for almost a year. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You got this.